Welcome to this That Slender presentation. Teotihuacan, a social history of the early Mexican metropolis. With David M. Carballo, Professor of Anthropology, Archaeology, and Latin American Studies at Boston University. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening for those of you tuning in uh, live, and, and thanks for uh, attending the live uh, feed, or, or if you're watching this archived, also thanks for tuning in. Uh, Jim, thanks for the introduction. Um, and, uh, you know, as Jim noted, I'll be talking today about Teotihuacan, and in particular, uh, lens of social history. And uh, what I mean by that is, you know, oftentimes this ancient city, the largest in its day in, in the Americas from you know, about the first uh, five to six centuries of our common era or AD, um, and also today one of the most visited sites in the world, certainly in the Americas in terms of tourists visiting archaeological sites, uh, oftentimes are rendered by um, a top-down perspective by which I mean the monuments, the uh, the religious system, the political order, which is somewhat ambiguous. I'll come to that towards the end. Um, when I first got into archaeology as undergrad, actually my first paper uh, was on Teotihuacan and in particular the Mexica Aztec use of Teotihuacan as a source of political legitimacy. Um, and so, you know, th those themes have always interested me, politics and religion, um, but more recently, especially with working in Tlahinga, I've come to focus a little more on daily life of what it would be like to live in this vast city uh, for your regular Teotihuacanos. Um, and, you know, when all those tourists, some three to five million tourists per year visit Teotihuacan, and one of the most common questions is, who built this city? Who were these people, right? Trying to, to, to place them within known cultures uh, or better known cultures than, for instance, the Aztecs or Mayas um, that are a little uh, better known, at least those terms, those ethnonyms, which are problematic in and of themselves. But um, uh, where Teotihuacanos, they don't have that same sort of familiarity. So I think uh, in some ways we've lost some of the human element to this city. And, and, and um, by working, especially in uh, household context, the Teotihuacanos lived in apartments, that I'll get to in a sec, um, we can sort of see m much more what life was like for, for average people, what were the attractions and detractions of living in the city, um, and we can think about, you know, uh, balancing out the, the focus on these massive pyramids and palatial compounds with regular folks uh, uh, living life in this ancient city. Now, the city, of course, gets its name from the later Mexica Aztecs who um, inhabited central Mexico a th almost a thousand years after the decline of Teotihuacan. Um, and this was a, a sacred city to Aztec peoples. It was seen as a place of origin, a place where the uh, fifth son of creation was set into motion. The gods sacrificed themselves for, for uh, the good of humanity at Teotihuacan. Um, and so we have images like you see here uh, on the top left. Uh, that's actually from an Otomi codex, the two major groups in central Mexico at the time of uh, the Spanish invasion or conquista were Nahua people that, that we often call Aztecs um, and Otomi people. They're two different language families. Uh, and these codices are, are, are from, from both groups. Um, and we also have on the right a more European style image and map called the Masapa map that has the pyramids rendered in green with the famous Avenue of the Dead and other elements of the city. So this was a city that was not lost to time. It was, uh, you know, known people lived there, continued to live around it after the political collapse of the city sometime in the sixth century. Um, and there was this active veneration and building from this city. I love the bottom left image is a, ma a, a mask rather called the Malinaltepec mask. And it is a classic period Teotihuacano mask, um, but it's been embellished uh, by Aztec peoples or post-classic peoples with turquoise and spondylus shell. 
um, literally using the foundations of this classic period civilization to uh, you know uh, render this new face. Um, and in some ways, the you know the Mexica were very much like that. They built on on certain precedents that uh, the Teotihuacanos had established. So you know today, I imagine uh, many people on this call or or tuning in have visited Teotihuacan. If if you haven't, I would certainly recommend it. It's one of the the ancient wonders of the world, at least in my book, um, it would have looked something like this, you know, probably when the Aztecs were venerating it in the in the you know 15th and 16th century. This particular uh, painting, I think, is from the um, late 18th century, uh, and then uh, you know this is how you see it today. How it's been reconstructed. The uh, professor who got me into archaeology, Tony Avini, the famous archaeoastronomer, he always liked to say, and it really stuck with me, that Teotihuacan is like a um, Hollywood set of an archaeological site because you walk up and down this Avenue of the Dead and you see these reconstructed pyramids. In many cases, they've just been consolidated with, in some, you know, in some cases, modern cement, although that's been changing because um, it has harmful effects to the buildings. Uh, but, you know, they've been sort of consolidated in the 60s uh, for tourism, um, but they're not really scientifically explored. And so it's, you know, sort of like you're walking down a Hollywood set and you see the buildings and there's nothing really behind them. It gives you the impression that this city is really well understood and, you know, has, has mostly been excavated, but it's a false impression. And there's so much more to learn, especially uh, of what life was like for, for normal Teotihuacanos. So just starting earlier, what, what preceded the city, some of my other work looked at this, the later formative period in central Mexico in particular, but you wouldn't say that Teotihuacan was the first city in central Mexico. So um, it, the basin of Mexico is largely today uh, inhabited by me you know, metropolitan Mexico City. Um, and in the south of that, Cuicuilco probably would be called the first uh, real city in central Mexico rising in the first millennium uh, BCE. Also in southern uh, Pueblo Tlaxcala, there were large centers like Xochitecat that you see over here. And so that was the first pulse of urbanization really taking off sometime in the mid first millennium BC. Um, and then uh, towards the end, uh, you know, about 100 uh, BC into the present era, uh, there was a second pulse of urbanization uh, that included Teotihuacan, but also two other cities, uh, Cholula, which has the largest pyramid by volume in the world. Uh, you see it over there with the church on top of it. And then Cantona, which is a very different type of city uh, than, uh, certainly than Teotihuacan and probably than Cholula. We know a little less about Cholula because it was uh, built over in the post-classic period and is still occupied today. So it has all these uh, superimposed layers on top of it. But Cantona was organized very differently with 25 ball courts and these small little plaza groups. So we have this, this diverse pattern of urbanism. There wasn't just one sort of template uh, in um, the classic period. And um, some of it seems to have been prompted by volcanic eruptions. In particular, the eruption of Popocatepet may be about 2,000 years ago, this is the smoking mountain that still uh, is um, to the southeast of Mexico City. And when that erupted, it was a VEI-6 eruption, um, which uh, in historical times, the volcano Krakatoa that erupted in the late 19th century in Indonesia and could be heard thousands of miles away in Australia. That was a VEI-6 eruption. So this was a really cataclysmic eruption. The ashfall carried eastward and pushed populations um, towards Cholula, but in the south of the basin of Mexico, um, which was is the lushest area, it's the most well-watered uh, part of the basin of Mexico and is where Cuicuilco was, populations also moved and migrated uh, to the north. And so we have some sort of settlement pattern shifts like this. You see it, those, uh, those uh, larger proto-urban or urban centers in the southern Puebla, Tlaxcala Valley, and Cuicuilco, and then a shift to this classic period system um, with uh, some sort of triangle around the three biggest cities, with Teotihuacan being the biggest of the three. So in the northern basin of Mexico, Teotihuacan arose in a context with 
less rain um, it, in the southern base of Mexico gets about a meter of rain uh, annual precipitation a year. Um, up in the Teotihuacan Valley, it's almost half that, about 600 millimeters of rain per year. But there is the benefit of springs or spring systems uh, that allowed for permanent irrigation over uh, a relatively large growing area. What you're looking at over here is a satellite image using Landsat satellite um, where you have some infrared bands in there. And I've manipulated those bands to make what's called a false color composite. And it really makes the vegetated areas pop out. So you see these to the southwest of Teotihuacan, uh, these, uh, these bright green springs. Um, the top left image is a historical one from, I think, the 50s or 60s. I oh, know this would be the early 60s when Penn State did a big project and the city was just being mapped um, near the, the cathedral in Teotihuacan, uh, where there was still standing water. And I even remember in my own career, starting at Teotihuacan in, in, in uh, the late 90s and then doing my dissertation into the early 2000s, there was a basketball court around here and I would, while I'm studying all these chips of obsidian and needed to take a break and stretch the legs, I would go shoot baskets. And if I um, shot poorly, they it would sometimes roll into a puddle area. So there was still standing water there uh, some 20 years ago and it's not there anymore. So uh, Mexico City is, has uh, used a lot of the groundwater and so the groundwater keeps dropping in the area. Um, but even if you go today into the area uh, just uh, southwest of the springs, um, some of the guys that uh, I work with uh, um, play soccer in this area, Pushla, and you can see that it had, that they actually call it Las Ranas, the frogs. It's a sort of a, a well-watered, wetter area there. So that was some of the agricultural potential of the media area. Um, but uh, the city developed more uh, through also attracting migrants and trade. Uh, and it made it an uh, extremely uh, multi-ethnic um, city. And so we have that in a few different ways. So here you're looking mostly at artifacts or art styles that come from different parts of Mesoamerica. So we have Maya style murals and hieroglyphs in certain compounds like Tetitla. We have Zapotec burials and effigy vessels of the storm god Coquillo. We have figurines. These are actually the ones from Michoacan or from our own excavations in Tlahinga, others from Veracruz. And so we can pinpoint different areas based on styles, and this has been done now for some decades, of migrants who came into the city. More recently, we can corroborate that sort of multi-ethnicity through different bone chemical analyses uh, with uh, isotopes of different elements like strontium and lead. Uh, and here, uh, Gina Buckley in the bottom left, she's someone who um, was a uh, Penn State grad student of Ken Hertz and worked uh, with us on the Tlahinga project and other places um, in uh, the Laventilla compound, which is another large uh, residential area. Uh, looking at isotopic signatures on the right is another publication um, from Solis from a, a different uh, area called Teopan Cusco, where Linda Manzanilla directed excavations for many years um, and identifying different migrants. Teopan Cusco has more people from the Gulf Coast. It seems to have kept some close ties uh, to the Nautla area of northern Veracruz, whereas in Tlahinga, the, the base population is largely seems to be Teotihuacano, but there were high uh, percentage of migrants, over 40%, um, coming from different areas but uh, more in the highlands um, and maybe some from Michoacan in West Mexico. Um, so here I've compiled some data. Mike, who's on the call, uh, uh, had some of this along with Gina's work uh, looking at different migrant populations uh, in Teotihuacan. And I've added a few others uh, just based on searches. Also for teaching, I'd like to include Boston here. Now these are, I need to unpack this slide a little bit, but um, you know, so when you're looking at on the left, those bars of percentage of migrants from different contexts of Teotihuacan, those are people who were born outside of the city uh, based on this bone chemistry. So we're looking at you know, over 40 to in the Zapotec or Oaxaca barrio where th that was an ethnic enclave of people from the Oaxaca Valley. These would have been Zapotec speakers um, all the way up to something like 80% of non-local residents. 
You can compare that to other published data sets like for ancient Rome and a couple Maya cities we have here, Tikal and Kalakmul. Um, the difference is looking at, so the figures I'm giving you here for Boston and the US, those are foreign born. So it's not just the amount of people who are born outside of Boston per se, but foreigners who uh, uh, live in Boston, the population is close to 30 or the US average, I think is something like 15, 17. Um, just to give you some comparable figures. But I mean, this is to say you really should compare them to the historical cases, but you can see that Teotihuacan had a very high migrant population. So then who were the Teotihuacanos, right? That's the question that we are, are often asked. And, um, and there's different ways of approaching this, but it is important to emphasize that they were, this was a multi-ethnic city and people came from different parts of Mesoamerica and there probably were some five different languages spoken in the city that we could reconstruct. There's some emerging consensus though, that the, the dominant uh, language was in the Udo Aztecan family. And there's a few, uh, and so this would have been a precursor to uh, what the Aztec lingua franca of Nahuatl would have been, though not exactly Nahuatl. This would be a thousand years earlier. So for instance, people like Magnus Faro propose uh, that it's um, a mix, something related to other Udo Southern Udo Aztecan languages. So that would include Nahuatl, but also the Cora and Huichol that are in more west, northwest Mexico. Um, and there probably were others. So the Otomangayan language family um, was the second largest in central Mexico 500 years ago. Uh, and people like uh, David Wright Carr have pointed out linguistically how in the 16th century, Nahuatl and Otomi, they basically, they were using the same terms for everything. There was sort of a shared, a very largely shared culture, even though they were speaking those two different languages. So I wouldn't be surprised if something were similar um, in the classic period in during Teotihuacan's apogee. Um, so what was attracting people to this city? Why were they migrating from different areas in such large percentages? Well, uh, the city did create what was at the time the most robust economy, I would say in the Americas. Um, and it uh, was a major production center. Um, and uh, there was production at scale. People lived in multifamily apartments and they could divide labor efficiently into uh, apartment-based production groups. So we would call that some sort of corporate kin, domestic production, a larger corporate groups. Um, there were clearly some sort of market exchange uh, based on spaces that looked like they would have served as marketplaces, but also the distribution of goods all throughout the city. Um, we would imagine that there was some sort of tax structure, like we know from the later Aztecs, um, and that potentially the uh, local elites who, who managed different districts of the city were both um, uh, manipulating labor tax uh, and then also sponsoring production in different ways, and then also ex long distance exchange. And this map on the bottom right is something that I've played around with of calculating the easiest routes by foot from Teotihuacan to different places that we know that they interacted with or where different commodities uh, were coming from. Uh, and it gives you some idea of those extents. Uh, other people like Linda Manzanilla has especially worked on the, the, the connections to the Gulf of Mexico. So we can also look at uh, Teo as a crafting center, as an economic hub. And here I'm taking data that Ken Hirth compiled for um, that uh, recent Dumbarton Oaks book, where he, what, he went through all this literature trying to come up with clearly documented different craft industries. And you can see Teotihuacan in comparison with some other uh, Mesoamerican urban centers, doubling you know, uh, uh, the, the, the second um, next highest crafting center of Mayapan. So Teotihuacan then was a high migrant, multi-ethnic city. It was a robust economy that had a lot of different craft activities and trade contacts. Um, how about the city itself? People often say that it stands out because of these big pyramids and its planned grid. And those two things are surely impressive. Um, and you know, when you walk the city, you get a, a sense of that orderliness and, and the scale of the monuments. But actually, a lot of cities were built on grids. 
And a lot of cities had big pyramids too. In fact, we saw Cholula on this image on top right had a bigger pyramid than any of the ones at, at Teotihuacan. So what was really unique about it though, was that um, it's a city of this scale of over 100,000 people where almost everyone that we know of, let's say 80 to 90% at least of the residents of this city lived in multifamily apartments with dozens of other people sharing residence. And there's still some work to be done on this. There's some debate about uh, how residential patterns were in the city. An early proposal from the 1970s by Mike Spence hypothesized that the dominant uh, residential pattern was patrilocal, meaning that women would marry into households maintained by uh, males, uh, male f lineages, family lines, um, with one notable exception, which was up in the uh, 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 Northeast of the city, the merchant's barrio that has ties to uh, the lowlands, to the, the Gulf of Mexico. In that case, the males seem to have been traders moving back and forth between the Gulf and the city. And so that was a matrilocal residential pattern in that area, meaning that the Teotihuacanas held down the residents. Now, since then, there's been a little more work in DNA analyses, and I think the results are still inconclusive, but they're interesting just to point out that there's a more recent proposal by people working with Linda Manzanilla that uh, Teotihuacanos had a neo-local residential pattern. So genetically, people don't seem to be um, uh, like favoring either a, a, a male line or a female line within an apartment compound, which might mean that there are new, new residential patterns that people are moving in and it's not tied um, to lineage in that way. But in any case, just here, this map, as you can see, is comparing at scale Teotihuacan with its contemporary imperial Rome. Um, and, uh, you know, their, their urban footprint was, was relatively similar. Rome had a much larger population, depending on who you ask, anywhere uh, between half a million to a million uh, residents. It sort of depends what your, what your um, estimates are there. Uh, in Rome, of course, there were apartments, the insulae, uh, but only about 25% of the city's residents lived in them, and they were lower status housing, multiple uh, stories, and you wouldn't want to live really on the top story because there are fire hazards and uh, um, it, they were um, uncomfortable dwellings in contrast to the apartment compounds at Teotihuacan, which were relatively comfortable. So looking at these compounds in a little more detail, um, we could have some range of a really tiny apartment compound might have only housed 20 people where the real large ones could have housed 10 times that. Uh, but um, George Kogel um, estimated that the average might have held around 60 of them. And there are some 2,000 to 2,300 of them estimated for the city. Only a handful of them have actually been excavated. and um, and even a smaller subset with more contemporary excavation techniques. So there's still a lot to learn from the apartment compounds and what daily life was like in them. But we do see that there was uh, diverse craft specialties that there seems to have been within compounds, certain things, um, certain forms of production that, that, um, that family members uh, uh, specialized in, high percentage of migrants we've already seen that are multi-ethnic. Um, and here's that last point that I was making about kinship still something to sort out. So either it was a patrilocal uh, pattern with some exceptions in the case of traders, or maybe this new line of data and more DNA analyses can resolve whether they were a neo-local residence pattern. But in any case, say, you know, apartments look something like this. I think, Mike, I'm using one of your images here on the bottom left that's highlighting uh, different uh, dwelling units or, or uh, household units within an apartment compound. On the right, that spinning video that you're looking at is the Tatitla compound, uh, part of it um, anyway. And you can see this uh, patterning around patios and also what the Romans would have called impluvia, these sunken areas with drains. Um, so here there's no exterior windows. And so light was coming in through these openings in the roof. Um, and that either would be in a patio that then has porticos around it. So you're getting some natural light uh, into uh, a shaded area uh, or in other small spaces, these sunken floors, because you would want to drain away rainwater that's coming in. So they are like these impluvia uh, that um, uh, you see with the Romans. 
So that's an apartment compound. And then at a higher level, you have apartments clustered into neighborhoods and districts. Uh, and the two that have been best or most comprehensively excavated uh, as of now are La Ventilla, which saw a few decades of work by Ruben Cabrera and Sergio Gomez. They recently published a two volume set on these excavations and analysis. Um, this you can see is, is just Southwest of the center of the city and the great compound. And then also Teopan Casco where Linda Manzanillo worked uh, for many years um, to the Southeast. Both of these though are relatively near the site center Whereas Tlahinga, which you see on the bottom of the map, is out on the southern periphery of the city. So we're trying to understand neighborhood organization uh, and, and um, what households or apartments were like on this more peripheral part of Teotihuacan. So another thing we're considering is what kept neighborhoods at Teotihuacan together um, and some lessons that we can learn from contemporary urban studies like for instance, this sociologist, Eric Kleinenberg, who's written this book on uh, palaces for the people and talking about social infrastructure. And there are other urban theorists who talk also about social infrastructure. And that in this, um, in contrast to, to so-called hard infrastructure, if you think of drain networks or road networks as hard infrastructure um, that are essential to urban life today, um, we also need these places to congregate, these places to come together uh, and enjoy life and uh, forge bonds with people that we see on a more regular basis. So places like parks, um, libraries, and other recreational facilities, this would be called social infrastructure of cities. And we can point to some Mesoamerican examples like that. So for instance, in the Aztec word world, the Calpulco or the center of the Calculi, your big house, would be an area that would have civic buildings, that would have the local school, that would have local temples, um, and that would be part of the social infrastructure of Tenochtitlan and other uh, Aztec cities. So um, at Teotihuacan, we're uh, also wondering what those look like and how they integrated uh, neighborhoods or even ones as distant as the Tlahinga compound. So here we are in the south of the city in Tlahinga, and some of my collaborators on the top left, um, Luis Barba and Agustin Ortiz and others from the, uh, the uh, per uh, Perspection Lab at UNAM, the National University. Um, and oh, here are, yeah, so I've worked in three different parts of Teotihuacan. So up, I started out in the, the Moon Pyramid with Saburo Sugiyama and Ruben Cabrera. I've also worked with the Sugiyamas in the uh, Plaza of the Columns complex. These are, you know, uh, one monumental uh, um, uh, temple complex and one palatial complex in the center of the city. Um, but this in contrast to Tilhinga, which I, I put a little image there of uh, the Lower East Side, that's actually where my father was born in New York, and Tilhinga could be comparable to something like the, the Lower East Side, not today, where you go and you tour a, a tenement museum, rather the, the actual tenements of, uh, you know, 100 years ago or so on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It, Tohingo is something like that, an uh, area with uh, the periphery of the city with, with higher uh, migrants and, um, and, and different uh, style housing. There was a previous project at Tohingo, and my predecessors there were um, uh, Rebecca Story and Dolph Widmer, who uh, excavated as part of a Penn State project directed by uh, um, Bill Sanders in the in Tlahinga, and they they almost entirely excavated one apartment compound known as Tlahinga 33. You see the floor plan over to the left. They um, discovered that the the uh, the occupants there were potters. They made uh, pottery that we know as San Martin orange ware, especially later in the occupation of this area. Earlier, they might have made some um, lapidary uh, stonework. Um, but we still see this today, actually, just this summer, I was walking the field in this area in the, the plaza near Tlinga 33, and you see, like on the top right, these potting tools. You see stuff for smoothing the clay, for making the different vessel forms, 
And these were totally utilitarian wares. They were amphoras and craters. They were for food production uh, and, um, and uh, mostly for food production activities, maybe some storage activities. They're just a monochrome orange ware, but they're nicely made. They seem to have been higher fired than other utilitarian wares. But they're a very practical ware uh, in the later part of the city's history. Rebecca is also a bioarchaeologist, and so the image on the bottom left is hers. And it's looking at the mortality rates for Tlhinga 33, along with some published data from Rome, and then a, a woodland site, so a, a more rural or, or you know, town village site. And you see the difference in infant mortality in the two cities. So in Teotihuacan and Rome, you have this higher mortality toll. Um, and that comes from the dense urban living and passing diseases um, that would have been part of early urban life. So here are the first views from the first two seasons at Tlahinga, and you can sort of see how far in the distance the pyramids are. I think that the, the um, moon pyramid is something like four kilometers away. The center of the city is about a couple kilometers away from Tlahinga. So it gives you an impression of the scale here and what it would have been like to live out on the periphery. But even though these folks lived way out in the southern periphery of the city, they were connected to it by the extension of the central artery, the so-called Street of the Dead. That's the name that the Aztecs uh, gave it, Nicotli. Uh, and um, here you see on a, a topo map on the, on the right, the depressed line uh, that's running through there, this lower area that was the central axis of the Street of the Dead. And so um, what we've been learning about working on the Street of the Dead is I, I think that there we could make some analogies to other grid plans and how they develop. So um, we seem to see some organic processes, generative processes of people filling in a landscape, but then also more planned or directed processes. And so just as a, an analogy, we can talk about uh, the creation of of Broadway. Broadway started, well, first it was a, a Lenape uh, footpath running through uh, Manhattan. And then when the Dutch came and colonized uh, the, the southern tip, um, they uh, consolidated that pass. They would bring their cows, their cattle out to, to graze past the wall, a famous wall of Wall Street that you see in that image, the map on the bottom left. And then consolidating the part into Broadway, which then became the central axis um, but the grid really wasn't established until later, into, into the 1810 in the commissioner's plan, and people set up markers like this one at different intersections of junctions of, of the streets to create the grid. At Teotihuacan, we actually have something similar in that there are these pecked cross elements, and some of them do seem to line up with the city's grid, and they might have been somehow involved uh, in planning the orientation of the uh, grid-like or orthogonal plan. Then when we actually excavated in this area in the Street of the Dead, we saw that it wasn't, it's not nice, uh, you know, covered in concrete and stucco like we have in the center of the city. Rather, it's cut volcanic tough substrate called tepetate. Tepetate is the Nahuatl word, which means sleeping mat of stone. And in this area, the, the people of Tlahinga sunk the tepetate, which is hard. It's hard to, to excavate even with uh, steel tools. And so this would have been with with uh, wooden, wood hardened ones or stone ones, they lowered this volcanic tuft by a meter, 40 meters wide, and some at least a kilometer, maybe even a kilometer and a half in length. Um, and that we've excavated in certain portions, but then in other areas, we've used ground penetrating radar to try to determine how long this cut lasts. So that would have been a major effort in terms of um, mobilizing labor for that. Whereas then you also see people um, putting their apartment compounds and building their own pretty crude retaining walls, um, which don't, don't, don't seem like a particularly centralized effort, probably a more local apartment building effort uh, like you have over here. And so we have some offset. This is a, on the bottom right. Uh, Spiro Kostov was an urban historian who talks about an, an initial plan with this nice you see the houses nicely hewing to the central artery. But then in reality, you get this sort of capricious behavior of filling in a landscape. And we see that exact thing at Tlahinga. So some, some of the houses are offset. They're not hugging the, uh, the line of the Street of the Dead. So Tlahinga started out when those the sun and the moon pyramids were being built. 
as a more rural landscape. There were probably agricultural fields there. In fact, we know there were. There were um, also some uh, irrigation canals that uh, the late Deb Nichols documented in this area. Um, and uh, in a few areas, we're able to excavate deep. This is one of the difficulties of Teotihuacan is that um, it, although you can hit pre-Hispanic layers pretty close to the surface, then you have this relatively nice architecture, which you don't want to destroy to get to earlier layers. But in this part of Tlhingo, we had just earthen floors. We had simpler architecture that uh, we felt like we could go down and, and document a, a, a stratigraphic sequence of um, constructions in this area. And so we went down um, over like two and a half to three meters deep until we hit the natural uh, substrate layer, the natural tepetate. And before, just before that, we hit a strange layer of tepetate that had been stamped down, like a tamped earthen floor with post holes in it. And this is a different mode of construction. So if actually looking at that image on the left, you can see something that um, looks more like this form of construction known to, today in Mexico as a jacal. It comes from the, the Nahuatl term shakali of a, of a, a wattle and daub house or a, you know, a perishable uh, structure like this one in a more rural setting that was earlier in the city's history. Um, and then if you look a little higher in these stratigraphic layers, you might be able to make out some adobe bricks. And that's when people shifted to this apartment form of living. And so here's a, a reconstruction based on the walls that we excavated of just some cutaway of, of what the, the apartment living would have looked like. And we have a number of dates here. And so this, this is going back to about the year 200 to about 550. And so that, that, that's the main occupation of, of Tlahinga is those 350 years. We do have a reoccupation. Remember, people didn't totally go away. And those last two dates that are later uh, come from a, a later burial of the Masapan phase. But here down over two and a half meters below the, the contemporary surface, we see different types of architecture. We also see hearths uh, like this. So uh, places where people cooked and made fire. And so that's a, a typical pattern. That's what we would see in the formative period. But then we stop seeing them when people move to apartments. And they seem to have adapted to living in dense concentrations in a dense urban space. And you couldn't just be billowing smoke into your neighbor's apartment. And so they adapted in different ways, probably doing a lot of the cooking outside and then maybe heating food uh, in, in stoves. Um, we also know that in Tlahinga, in one of the apartment compounds, they were obsidian nappers or obsidian producers, craftspeople. And this is something that I worked at first um, at the Moon Pyramid, where we documented a large workshop, but it was a very specialized state workshop for making weapons. And so this is where dart points were made by the thousands, probably, along with some ceremonial items, uh, little effigy um, uh, uh, predator animals like uh, serpents and and canines and or felines um, and and then other sort of large bifacial uh, objects. So a very specialized form of production. Whereas at Tlahinga, it was domestic production, utilitarian production, just like with the pottery that we saw, the thin or, or the um, San Martin orange utilitarian cooking ware. Here we have your basic cutting implement for Teotihuacan, the, the prismatic obsidian blade. And thankfully for us, they were depositing all the cores and they have all the, the whole um, sequence from, you know, the, probably the core on the top left of that bottom image weighs some five kilos on its own uh, down to spent cores at the bottom. Um, and so we've worked with, uh, also with Alejandro Pastrana, the Mexican archeologist who's been working at the major obsidian mine, the Pachuca or Sierra de las Navajas obsidian mine. And we can see some similar production techniques between the mine uh, and here uh, in, in uh, the Tlhenga workshop. So um, in, in the workshop, we only excavated, we actually missed the densest concentrations of this workshop. Um, you can see we did some augering on the left here, and the really dense uh, concentrations are to the south of where we excavated. Nevertheless, in this relatively small area, we only excavated six weeks here, we extracted 425 kilos of obsidian. So the quantity is just you know, amazing, like it, it's a, a very dense, a really high scale utilitarian production of obsidian blades. 
And here you can see part of the residence and then to the left, that's an earthen platform before you come down to the Street of the Dead. And that's where they were doing most of the actual napping, where they were actually producing the obsidian, is outside, of course, of their living quarters. You wouldn't want to be walking over this really sharp glass. Um, but they were depositing as offerings some of the cores um, associated with this drain feature and other sort of caches that are in the residential area uh, that you see on the right. One of the really interesting things we can see here is that there's a range of skill levels. Some of the obsidian working here was expertly done. So I'll uh, point out the, the core that you have on the top right is an amazing core. I, when, as a grad student, I you know, got into um, working uh, stone to be able to understand the, the production process. And I never got to that stage. I got you know to sort of an intermediate napper stage, I could make dart points pretty similar to the ones you see on the bottom. But to be able to make and maintain a prismatic core like you see on the right is um, really exceptional, someone who's working at it probably daily. Whereas on the left, that core looks like someone who's just getting started. That My core would look a lot more like that one with these irregular uh, scars for blade removal. And then when you look down at the points, you see an expert point to the right. In the middle, you see one where the, the uh, napper made two pretty bad errors. They made what, what are called hinge fractures, where they didn't um, appropriately hold the piece and let the, the, the flake carry off to thin it. And then on the left, you see someone who maybe is just getting started. So uh, at BU, I, I do some stone working with students only about once a year. And so my uh, abilities have deteriorated, but I can see uh, also someone who's just starting out. Um, uh, they might not be able to even produce what's on the left there, but uh, you know, this is someone who's just getting started. So um, Raphael Mena, the artist that uh, uh, I'm working with, we, we talked about an image that would convey this sort of crafting apprenticeship. Um, and uh, here you see a blade maker and uh, showing the trade to a child. And so that's based on excavation data we have and the actual working on the platform. Um, this other compound that we excavated at, we here we excavated more in the patio area. You can sort of see these uh, open patios that are um, cut flagstone. So it's a it's um, it's a stone lined floor. Uh, and here we do have a lot of these tools that you see on the top left. They if, if they might look familiar to you if you've ever like done some tile backsplash on your kitchen or in your bathroom. It's a float, um, and basically that form works well for putting on um, also uh, plaster or uh, just even a mud mortar that's going on top of the building. So it seems some there they are some sort of masons tools, and potentially the folks who lived here had some sort of more activities in in masonry. Um, and then we have this really nice mask. So I showed you the mask covered in turquoise. This one is not covered in turquoise, as you can see. But here is one of the uh, iconic forms of art for the city. Uh, these uh, carved stone faces, they're called masks, but their eyes are not really cut off and they couldn't be worn by a living person, really. So they probably went on top of effigy bodies. Um, and uh, representing ancestors. And in this case, we found it in one of the patios had been terminated with a lot of smashing of domestic uh, objects that you see here. So you can see all this pottery broken on the patio floor. If you look on the top left, you can see actually a really nice one of those float-like objects or smoothers. Uh, there's some you know, maize grinding implements. So a very domestic signature. It, it gives us an idea of you know, what they're cooking with and, and serving food in. But then they also deposited this nicer mask feature that you know, probably represented an ancestor of uh, the compound. Here's a reconstruction of, of some of those uh, complete pots for this area. And so these are actually the San Martin orange where uh, that would be made just to the west in Tlahenga 33 in the, in the plaza area. So we're seeing a lot of um, utilitarian form production uh, and um, the, of these folks living out on the periphery. Um, and you might have also noticed from those images that there wasn't elaborate stucco covering buildings. Uh, the buildings are made of a combination of rock and some adobe. The coverings of the, the structures um, were more earthen 
Uh, and so the construction materials were a little simpler than you see in apartments in the center of the city. Now, this is different than what we see in the neighborhood center. So the neighborhood center are these buildings to the west of the Street of the Dead extension. And we've spent uh, some time mostly working at the two that you see in the bottom, uh, number two and number four of Grid Square, South 4, West 1. Uh, we've also done a little work in the plaza that you see the open space. Um, and I'm also uh, denoting where 33 is to the west. And then 17 was the obsidian workers compound and 18 was where the mask was found. So we have three fairly well-documented apartments and now we're looking at uh, these public spaces or semi-public uh, spaces uh, that are more elaborately constructed. And so here's where uh, Raphael's recent reconstruction uh, is based on this work that uh, we've been doing here. So we can see what the buildings that are elevated on platforms that were covered with uh, lime plaster. Uh, lime is non-local, it needed to be imported uh, from the Tula region uh, to the Northwest. Um, and then the apartments that you see, they don't have that coating and they weren't elevated on platforms. And so we, we have a different uh, type of construction indexing different statuses or different roles uh, for these buildings. So here, this was uh, in 2019, working at um, three of these different mound clusters uh, down to the South of the platform. Here they are, we've, we've excavated now. Uh, this summer I returned, and so I will be showing some new stuff fresh out of the ground. Actually, you'll be the first people to see some of this, uh, that what we excavated just in, in 2023, and then the other ones we did in, in uh, 2019, and of course the pandemic uh, broke up our time there. Um, but so in 2019, here's a, a patio area in one of these platform complexes. Um, and uh, here's a reconstruction with, with different finds here. And so um, we found in the central patio a Weiwei Teot or a, a, a old god of fire brazier and also parts of a um, theater style incense burners. These are two of the classic ceremonial ritual incense burners for Teotihuacan. One's made of stone and depicts this long-lived deity associated with uh, fire and the center of the earth or universe. And then the other one are mass produced uh, um, at the uh, at the Feathered Serpent Complex or in the, at, the, at the Ciudadela Complex um, and are made of ceramic and have these uh, chimneys behind them. And, and so both of them were really important in rituals. And here that's found right in the center of the patio, sort of uh, denoting this as some sort of uh, ritual space. And then we also have some different cash deposits with uh, interesting non-local materials, including iron ore beads and uh, spondylus shell beads, spondylus shell coming from the Pacific coast. And here we also have buildings covered in plaster and some of them painted with murals. And so you can see this uh, bird mural that's uh, on the left over there. Oops. Thing is not advancing. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so um, here are some of these same uh, items. Many of them came from this one sort of uh, um, box deposit, like uh, on the central axis of a building, this cash deposit um, made with these sort of mud stone walls. Uh, and uh, there you have the, the um, uh, iron ore beads are either uh, magnetite or pyrite. They do have a magnetic property. So we actually dangled one of them from a string and put a magnet near it and it moves. So it has ferromagnetic properties. Um, and we have to sort of determine whether it's pyrite or magnetite or, or maybe it's a mix of the two of them. You can see some of it decomposes into this uh, powdery um, yellow. That's typical of pyrite. The only other place I know of these in Teotihuacan or that at least has been published is in the uh, elaborate tunnel that leads to the Feathered Serpent Pyramid, where all these offerings, Sergio Gomez and team worked there for uh, many years and extracted wonderful offerings. But there's one of the, you know, sort of the most central state ritual deposits has these. Um, but it's strange that out on the periphery of the city, 
uh, we also have them and have, have spondylus beads and other uh, finery of this type. So some of the murals de decorating these buildings, they're partials. A few of them were in situ, but most of them had, had come off the walls. But you see motifs of birds, butterflies, flowers, all of those are sort of associated in iconography of Tejo Khan and known from the later Aztecs as being part of a flowery afterlife. So that image on the bottom right, that actually comes from a mural right in front of the Sun Pyramid, an area called uh, Zone 5A or the Sun Palace. Um, but we have the same sorts of, of images there. We also have these bands, these decorative bands that have fire images with water images. And that recalls the uh, famous um, defrasismo or, or metaphoric couplet in Nahuatl of fire water, atlachi noli, uh, like you see, for instance, on the Teokali of sacred war. Um, this is such a great image. This is a Mexica one that's on the right, but those of you who are unfamiliar with it, um, there's the image that you have on the Mexican flag today, the eagle on the cactus. Uh, but coming out of the eagle's uh, beak is this water fire that it has to do with warfare and also a primal generative element. And so, so you know, th that's all to say that these are some high level concepts. These are some high level religious concepts, um, but they're being expressed way to the south on the urban fringe um, and, uh, and shows that, you know, these folks clearly were tied into the religious system of the city and, and, and probably understood these high level concepts as well. The other complex we excavated in um, had green uh, murals. And so that was different than the ones we just saw, including blocks with the jade beads or chalchiwi motifs that you see on the top left, and then uh, some stars and feathered eyes. Uh, and uh, we also even have some sculpture that seemed to be either, I don't know, feathers or scales that you see on the, the left. So this sort of construction is much more elaborate. This wouldn't be out of place in the center of the city rather than out on the uh, urban periphery. Um, so it means that you know folks out in the urban periphery had access to these nicer spaces, that the neighborhood centers, the social uh, infrastructure uh, was nicer even out on the periphery. So here, here's some new stuff. So the, um, the bottom image is the little bit that we excavated in compound two in 2019. And then the other two are what we accomplished uh, this summer where um, I wanted to do a mix of horizontal excavations, but also getting some depth when we were allowed to because getting that stratigraphic sequence uh, is so important. And so here's our you know, working uh, um, images of this, another one of these central patio complexes up on this elevated platform. Um, and you can see these extrapolations for the different buildings that we had here. Um, and then here uh, is uh, my new toy for the summer was having an iPad Pro that has a LiDAR sensor. Um, and so with that, you can do photogrammetry uh, which works really well for the excavations to be able to, as you're going in real time, being documenting uh, the different um, architectural layers like you see here. And you see different superimposed uh, buildings that I'll uh, uh, unpack in a second. Um, but you can see that we come to architecture relatively soon, only 10, 15 centimeters below the uh, modern surface, but then it can go down much deeper to get to the, the substrate um, a couple meters or two and a half meters down. So looking at this now without all the spinning, um, you can see these different construction layers. Uh, so I've, I've you know, made a, on the bottom like a, a stratigraphic cut where you can see these buried buildings, these earlier buildings. Um, so we had the, the last uh, layer here, we have some parts of it. We have the entrance, we have the front wall, but then it would have risen, uh, you know, there had been a step up uh, to uh, get to the floor level of the last building, and that's totally washed away. And so that allowed us to then go underneath and see what was uh, this, what, what substructures uh, were underneath without dismantling any original uh, architecture, because it had already washed away. And so you see these different elements of buildings. And what we're looking at is something like here on the bottom right. So we have this uh, smallish room structure. It has its you know, classic Teotihuacan pattern of an entrance with a portico that would allow natural light in, but had a roof on top of it, and then the back room. 
And then we have something pretty weird. Uh, this uh, The building to the right has a very nice southern facade, and then the facade leading to uh, this uh, smaller building is seems much simpler. You can see that it has stone, exposed stone that you see in the central image, and then a staircase made of adobes. And that I have never seen anything excavating over 20 years in Teotihuacan like that. Usually staircases have balustrades. They're not made of adobe. They're made of, of stone. Um, and so this is some different pattern. It's like a back stair that leads to this other building. And um, it all was relatively nicely preserved because when they buried it, they put all river sand, just pure sand. And um, we've seen some sand as fill in um, actually that, that box offering where some of the, those uh, iron ore beads came out of, but not this quantity. Here they just filled in room blocks with pure sand. So they would have been you know, um, uh, schlepping these basket loads of sand to fill it. And it had the effect of preserving it for us. So if they had just thrown in rocks and soil uh, willy-nilly, then um, we would have uh, you know, had much more destruction, much uh, less well-preserved substructures uh, than we did here. And so you can see some of those, like look at how nicely preserved on the top right, those adobe blocks. Some of them we would excavate and it looked like they just were made recently um, and they weren't you know, over 1500 years old. So um, here, looking at this one structure, this one structure has some elements and uh, you know interpretations still to come. We're still sorting through this. We have not analyzed the materials from here. I only recently sent out radiocarbon dates. They're supposed to be back uh, very soon. I would have liked to have been able to report on them tonight, um, but they're not quite there yet. Um, but that includes some of the maze that you see on the bottom left. That That is... Um, uh, those are, are uh, you know, um, corn uh, uh, husks uh, that, you know, had been carbonized. There were little carbonized corn kernels also, or, or corn cobs rather. Um, and so we can directly date those uh, and get some sense of at least the termination of the substructure uh, that you see over here. Um, we also have at the lowest level in the Tepetate level, uh, another domestic pattern is that there um, are some burials. And so burials typically are you know, um, in domestic space under the floors of houses. And so it's interesting to note that in the last compound I showed you with the bird murals, um, we didn't have any burials. So that seemed like a different type of uh, function. We also had almost no food uh, production tools, so no manos and metates, no things for making food. So, the, the, so we have some negative evidence that might suggest that a different type of function. But here in the uh, lowest levels, we do have um, some subfloor burials with some offerings like this uh, vessel and some, uh, uh, these are more spondylus shell beads, these tiny little lunates uh, made of obsidian, a little piece of quartz crystal that you see over there. Then the front of this building um, has some preserved murals. It's a band and has uh, red discs on it. So it would have been something like this. Uh, and, and so this would be an early, more elaborately made construction than the one that was behind it, accessed by those adobe steps. Um, and uh, you know had a, a painted facade along these lines. So, um, I'll come back to that, but just remember the two substructures. We have one that's sort of a painted uh, uh, construction that could have had more of a temple function and then a residential function behind it. Later on, people kept building sequentially on top. Um, and here we see, we found this tiny little uh, decorative element. Um, we, they're called alminas. It's an Arabic word that made its way through Castilian Spanish for roof adornments. We see them in different parts of Teotihuacan, but here you have a miniature one. And these are ones, and this is actually right where there should have been an altar, but there was a lot of looting in this particular area in the patio. And if you look on the bottom left, this is from the Atatelco compound, and you can get an idea of what we might be dealing with, some sort of um, effigy altar temple that had these adornments associated with it, with the so-called year sign of Teotihuacan that you see uh, to the right. Also, after these substructures, there was a deposit over here. Well, first, um, on the right, you're looking at a drain. That would have drained the last patio. So all patios that people needed to move water away, and so they made these drain features. 
But then uh, to the side of this drain feature, we have this interesting thing sticking out of the profile and eventually uh, more towards the end of the season, we excavated there. You see these flagstones. The flagstones once covered the drain and they'd been moved to the side and there was a lot of um, painted stucco, but extremely fragmented because they were painted adobes. They weren't on the nice concrete, so it wasn't uh, preserved. Um, but within this deposit, we found this really fascinating sherd that you see on the bottom right. Um, and uh, here's a little larger image. And it has elements that are Teotihuacano and elements that are Maya. Um, and in fact, in the plaza of the columns, uh, Nawa Sugiyama excavated part of a vessel that has this bright red uh, that uh, probably is cinnabar um, inside of it and is this high relief carving um, uh, that you see here. Um, and so this has elements, so it has elements of both cultures. It looks like there is part of a classic Maya hieroglyph at the bottom right uh, of the sherd. Um, we also have regular Maya pottery in Tlahinga, not in high quantities, but there's some of it um, that you see in the bottom. But if you look at the face, there's a speech scroll coming out of it. That is a fully Teotihuacano convention, right? So if you look up on the murals, like from Tepantitla, you see that convention of speech. Um, and I really wish this thing were complete, uh, you know, in some ways, if you could have matched whatever the Teotihuacano is saying, whatever that's associated with, with the Maya hieroglyph, maybe this would be a mini Rosetta Stone for understanding the Teotihuacan writing system. Unfortunately, this is all we've got of it, but it's really fascinating that you have this, um, this hybrid style that yeah, you see in other parts of the city as well. And we, other stuff is clearly Zapotec, or from Michoacan. So once again, the multi-ethnicity is not just in the city, it's in every district, it's within neighborhoods. And so there were these inter-regional contacts um, throughout. So here's my reconstruction then of this particular platform complex. That So what we're missing is right here, structure 2B on the top. That was largely washed away. All we have is the front entrance to it and then the floor behind it and then some sort of patio that had an altar on it. But these substructures, um, which are much earlier, still to be dated, they um, overlie the original soil, the paleo soil, uh, which is called the uh, San Pablo Paleosol, um, has been worked on by uh, uh, different um, geoarchaeologists. This was the original soil of the Teotihuacan Valley when people first settled here. So we have this great stratigraphic association then with, with the, the, the first occupation being right on top of this Paleosol. Um, and so we have something that looks a little more like maybe a residence associated with a small temple, then being turned into a high platform of some two meters high with a patio and altar complex like that seem to be some sort of temple structures. So it turns out though, you know, I, I started the talk talking about apartment compounds, still find them very interesting, but I've probably excavated more platform complexes now at Teotihuacan than, um, than apartment compounds. And so this is uh, includes at the Moon Pyramid, both sides have platform complexes uh, where I excavated. At Plaza of the Columns, we excavated another platform complex. And now down in the Southern uh, um, Neighborhood Center in Tlhinga, uh, where we have at least three of them and have worked at two of them. Um, it's harder to understand exactly what these things are. They seem to be mixed function. It's not um, as clear as an apartment compound that were clearly domestic spaces. Um, in some cases, we might be looking at uh, temple residences, or so these are residences that are associated with, with temples. Uh, they might have been occupied by religious specialists of some sort, or in the case of neighborhood districts, the local elites, uh, what uh, Linda Monsonia calls the intermediate elites of the city, might have resided on these, and they had some semi-public functions. They would be, you know, ritual spaces, uh, elaborately decorated with murals, um, but then also might have some residential functions. We might also see evolution through time, uh, like the substructures uh, leading to uh, the later structures. But I think it's something that is pretty key for understanding the social, socio-political dynamics of the city is how these different platform complexes um, 
uh, functioned and you know which ones were more public space, which ones more were more elite residences and what might have been a combination of the two. Okay, so now moving into the realm of sociopolitics before closing out here. Um, so, you know, so we seem to have this distribution of relatively uh, nice semi-public spaces, even out on the outer uh, periphery of the city. Um, and that does lead into the model that Teotihuacan had at least outwardly a collective face to it. Um, the art of the city de-emphasizes any individuals. It uh, emphasizes gods, it, it emphasizes social roles, uh, the cosmic order, the calendar. Um, in over 120 some odd years of excavations at Teotihuacan, no one has compellingly found a royal burial for this city. Um, there is a, a, an inordinate emphasis, uh, at least in the mid part of the city's history, in housing its whole population in these relatively nicely made apartment compounds. And these all seem to be different methods of incorporating this very diverse uh, um, populace that had probably at any given time 40% of the residences uh, or residents might have not been born in the city. So, for instance, here calling on Gary Larson, uh, you know, uh, in many societies it's obvious who the ruler was. Um, and uh, in Teotihuacan, it hasn't been. And, and uh, specialists continue to debate um, exactly who the socio political organization is. Um, I've said my own piece on this, uh, but I would emphasize that um, these sorts of images of this utopic paradise like that you see in, in the Tepantitla murals, that it's uh, more about um, keeping the cosmic order going, that good things like irrigated fields on the bottom left will prosper uh, with due diligence to uh, pay to the to the gods, uh, to the storm god and, and maybe the great goddess. And you see the scene of people frolicking and playing games, playing ball games. When you see individuals, uh, they're often in procession. It seems like their role is important rather than their individuality. Uh, and many times they seem to be deities or people impersonating, impersonating deities. Um, and rather than uh, individuals, like we have the more individualized classic Maya art, for instance, um, and then other in other periods of, of Mesoamerican history, uh, we have this more sort of uh, collective face. Um, of course, people have you know made a, a, a big deal about the the entrada, the so-called entrada into the Maya lowlands and figures um, like spear thrower owl or striker owl. Um, this personage, um, I happen to believe that this is a title. This is a is some sort of title of power, of rulership, of a, a, a war title, um, who the Maya might have treated as an individual during the Entrada, but certainly wasn't a singular person. We This imagery we have in Teotihuacan for centuries, um, and I don't think it's tied to one particular individual in the minds of the Teotihuacanos. It might have been in the minds of Maya scribes in this one chapter of history, uh, but um, I don't think that uh, you know this, this is necessarily the single king of Teotihuacan. It could have been. It could have been a paramount ruler. It could have been some war chief. It could have been a, a, some sort of title um, of, uh, of power in Teotihuacan. That doesn't seem to be in dispute. But the emphasis within Teotihuacan isn't so much on those sorts of personages, it's on the gods, it's on the cosmic order. And what what, what does the, the major labor go into? It goes into you know, temples and, and sculptures depicting deities, uh, not god kings. So um, one thing I, I uh, certainly like to point out is that having large constructions in and of themselves does not imply anything about governance. It doesn't imply that that was an autocratic governance or even that it was a centralized polity. And here, for me, is exhibit A of that, the Perun Dam complex, which was built in the formative period um, by small isolated villagers, about 1100 to 500 BCE. This is in the Tehuacan Valley, the very arid Tehuacan Valley, which can become come, uh, quite uh, productive if you control water. And so this Purun Dam complex that uh, Jim Neely and others have documented over a couple decades 
um, has close to 400,000 cubic meters of construction volume that could hold close to a million cubic meters of water. And for some comparison, you know, the, the moon pyramid, when it got large in its sixth phase, was not that large in volume. And the amount of water it held would be more than all the ones at El Mirador combined. Um, and um, and this is based on Hansen's work with LIDAR, the, those Mir uh, Mirador reservoirs haven't uh, yet been reconstructed. But, you know, um, the, what I want to emphasize here is that these are relatively small settlements of low thousands of people who are who are pooling this labor together. And so it's much more important what the labor is directed towards. Is it directed towards a fancy palace or is it directed towards something that's good for the community? And we need to have those conversations, not like just, uh, you know, um, uh, come to rash conclusions that big pyramids mean top down rulership or, or powerful kings, because we don't see that. That doesn't make any sense, that argument. So for instance, we could look at the ratios of say the palaces to the temples of major cities. And here we do see some differences. So for instance, um, Tenochtitlan's palaces were larger relative to the Temple Mayor than Teotihuacan's presumed palaces are um, relative to its temples. So, so more labor was directed at temple construction at Teotihuacan than was to palatial construction. And that might be telling us something about their governance and, and how it might have varied compared to Mexica governance. We can also look at indices of inequality. Uh, and uh, uh, Mike uh, Smith, who's on this call, has, has um, uh, shown the low inequality in Teotihuacan. I think he's revised this number recently uh, upward, but still relatively low in terms of inequality in ter based on domestic living space. I've also uh, played around with stature data. So if we look at skeletons, um, all things being equal, uh, differences in stature are an index of inequality because people are eating better diets than others. If the elites are eating be uh, better diets than others, they grow taller and you see more of a discrepancy. And so we can see that. So for instance, in these samples, and, um, and, and uh, uh, this is drawing on some publications uh, by Carl's Bois, uh, but Mycenae and Egypt have much more market inequalities than the two Mesoamerican contexts uh, here. So eventually, the system that looked uh, compelling and, and uh, collective and attracted migrants for centuries fell apart. Um, and so what exactly happened there? Again, this is a, a topic of debate, and, and um, I happen to believe it must have involved multiple causes, because we know that there were periods in Teotihuacan's history where there was some sort of stress. So for instance, when the Feathered Serpent Pyramid was desecrated and covered over, that must have been some almost like a civil war within the city or some sort of major political co uh, conflict. But the city survived after that. Um, but what happened around 550 to 600 was different. Um, potentially, there was some climatic stress. Here are some of our radiocarbon dates uh, mixed with some um, paleoclimatic data suggesting a period of stress. Others, like Ian Robertson, have suggested increased inequality can be seen in terms of uh, the access to goods in different parts of the city. Um, people like Linda Monsonia have talked about elite fracture or that the intermediate elites uh, co-opt some of the power of the corporate state. Um, but in any case, what happens, uh, what you see on the ground is that the city was um, systematically burnt and looted, its major monuments and palatial compounds, sometime around 550, 575 or so. We also see the closing of those trade corridors that connected the city with different areas and the breakdown into smaller political units. And um, Teotihuacan still remained a you know, couple tens of thousands of people um, through the epiclassic period uh, and into the early post-classic. And so, for instance, here excavating a plaza of the columns and the moon pyramid, you see this systematic destruction of buildings, the burning of buildings. We don't see that at Tlhinga, so that's something that's important to note. So if there were sort of a marauding army, you would expect the periphery of the city would also be burned, and we don't see that. So this is some sort of purposeful destruction with iconoclasm, like at Shala, where Monsignor excavated. 
Um, I've worked a little in northern Tlaxcala on these trade corridors, and here we see um, the larger settlements that were right in this trade corridor um, go away and it becomes disoccupied and people flee into the hills. So that speaks of some sort of stress and, and uh, escalating warfare uh, in what we call a, in central Mexico the epiclassic period that would sort of be the late classic uh, in the Maya area. So what goes away with Teotihuacan? Um, uh, and uh, uh, Mike has also worked on this issue. I'm interested in, in looking at what, what, what the antecedents were, what, what came before, uh, what what uh, persevered throughout the city uh, and then continued even up towards uh, the Aztec period. And then what were novel inventions at Teotihuacan and um, uh, and what maybe went away with the city. So, so for instance, we have certain urban patterns like having your major temple facing to the West. We see that starting in the formative period. It continues through Teotihuacan, it continues through the Temple Mayor. Um, but we, we see a change where before there was a, a, a organization around a central plaza, around a, an epicenter, um, and we don't see that at Teotihuacan. Um, and so that, that goes away. We don't see formal ball courts. Maybe early on uh, where Sergio Gomez and, and Julie Gasola have been excavating in the um, Ciudadela, there was some sort of early stage ball court, but then um, that pattern goes away. Um, we do see this new change in a, a, a organization around a major central avenue and orthogonal uh, layout. Within the domestic sphere, we continue a formative pattern of houses arranged around patios. We continue a pattern of subfloor burials. Um, but new are these multifamily apartments, which also seem to go away with the city. Tula has some uh, um, uh, smaller apartments. They're not the dominant housing type, though. Um, having your hearths in your house, that also seems to correlate with uh, not having an apartment living. We have the classic Talud Tablero facade that originated before Teotihuacan in Puebla Tlaxcala, but then became a Teotihuacan type and continued a little later into the Epi Classic. Uh, likewise, thin orange ceramics originated from that Puebla Tlaxcala area and carried through the city, whereas the theater style sen ceramic sensors seem in a Teotihuacan invention, possibly with some antecedents in the formative, but then they go away. Um, and then we have some weird stuff happening. Like, so for instance, in the later formative, people made you know, uh, ceramic dishes with really high feet on them. Uh, and they made projectile points with diagonal um, notches on them. In Teotihuacan, those the tall feet go away. They have these little nubbin supports uh, on, uh, on, on vessels like that, and they make stemmed points. And then when the city collapses, those things come back in favor again. It's almost like they were trying to do something opposite. And you go back to diagonal notch points and, and high supports on ceramics. So, um, so it seems like in some cases, Teotihuacan was trying to be different. It was trying to forge this new identity that grounded certain and uh, Mesoamerican patterns and kept continuity with some cer certain key things like how you orient your main temple and, and how you uh, uh, organize domestic space. But lots of these other things seem to have been innovations of the city. And so then that is the decline of Teotihuacan, but Teotihuacan never goes away. It never loses its salience to people. Um, people continue to live around it. I didn't have time to show, but we, you know, we we excavated a lot of Masapan phase deposits this summer. So that would be the Toltec period. In the Aztec period, as many people lived in the Teotihuacan Valley as did uh, during the Classic period. And so, so this was an area, uh, the, the, the pattern changed. People lived in a ring around the city, just like the colonial towns that are there today, San Juan, San Martin, San Francisco. Um, and the city lives on as an important place for Mexican national patrimony. People go there uh, by the you know many tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands and things in days like the spring equinox. The city's uh, reconstruction of its pyramids, the Sun Pyramid was reconstructed to commemorate Mexico's independence from Spain, the centennial of independence, and then the Street of the Dead and the Moon Pyramid were uh, reconstructed in time for the Olympics to come and the Olympic torch to go on top. So this is a, a place that is uh, uh, forever um, an eternal city, an eternally remembered city uh, uh, within Mexico. 
Um, okay, so that's all I have, uh, and um, I am very happy to take any questions you might have. Oh, Jim, I think you're muted. <laughs> that was really great. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions, and uh, Michael Smith has been making some comments. So I've asked him to unmute, but I don't think he has yet. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, yes, he has. <laughs> so you want to uh, interact here and make make your comments? Uh, well, the Gini index, I'll point that out. The figure of 0. 0.12 was based on a faulty calculation. Oh, that's is, too low, right. It, it's figured out. That's over 0. 0.3 something? 0. 0.41. 0. 0. Oh, okay. So it's, it's not, not particularly low. It's not particularly high either. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Yes, start using those numbers. Anything else, Michael? Well, um, no. Well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if other people have questions. Right. Okay. Um, Joe's asking, "What is cements?" deleterious effect on reconstructions? Um, so contemporary cement doesn't breathe. And so the the um, bonding agents like Teotihuacan's uh, concrete um, is an amalgam that has uh, clay, a little bit of lime in it, uh, that that really gives it its, its adhesion. Uh, and, uh, you know, local sands, muds, sort of organic materials uh, local to the area. Um, and those allow the, the buildings to breathe, meaning when when uh, moisture gets inside of them, they have a way of, of exiting. And so a lot of the reconstructions that were done with contemporary cement, uh, so for instance, the Feathered Serpent Pyramid, um, the moisture was going into the monument and uh, then causing the sculptures to just pop out. Like, so there was no way of uh, draining the monument. And so, th so those serpent heads were like coming off the monument. So since then they've been very carefully removing all the modern cement and using a more ancient style recipe. And that's when we, um, uh, at the end of the season, we will consolidate using this natural lime you know, local to the area and natural sediments. Um, and that's what Ina, the uh, Mexican National Institute of Anthropology wants us to do um, before we cover everything back over with uh, with soil to, to bury the excavation. So that allows, yeah, for the monument to, to, to breathe more, but also to stay consolidated. All right, and Soaring Bear is asking pyrite iron or beads from where? Any signs of attempt to smelt? Um, no uh, signs of smelting at this stage. So smelting comes in, uh, people think, I'm, I'm not a metallurgy specialist, but people think from uh, Northern South America. So from um, like Ecuador and Northern Peru uh, into West Mexico around the time that Teotihuacan is active, but it doesn't really make it to Teotihuacan. You don't start seeing bronze show up until um, the epiclassic period uh, and then the early post-classic period. Then, then you do have bronze technology and, and smelting. And that does really seem to be through diffusion. It came from uh, South America um, and is uh, and usually arsenic-based bronzes. Uh, the pyrite... Um, I was looking up sources, but it, there's not, we haven't yet documented these particular beads where they might've come from. And I don't think that there's, uh, you know, a good, um, right now, the, 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 the trade relations in, in those materials have been worked out. But I, um, I think a little more to the South, uh, like uh, um, to Oaxaca, I know mica comes from Oaxaca. So we do have quantities of mica, um, but pyrite, forgetting where people say it is, it's not right in the basin of Mexico, it's somewhere south of there. It might not be as far as Oaxaca, it might be more like Guerrero or uh, Morelos. Hmm. And Anon is uh, questioning, were any drains used for waste or drinking water 
uh, or from toilets, which I believe have been found at the site. Yeah, there has been work on toilets. I haven't, I, I do need to uh, read up on that a little more. But yeah, I mean, so drinking water was done by wells and people still have wells at Tejuacan, but they have to now go down something like 30 to 40 meters. Um, but in classic period times, you know, just digging a, I think a five meter well would have been enough to get uh, good, good drinking groundwater. And so that's how they were getting fresh water. Um, but uh, yeah, then toilets, I mean, it, probably there were some centralized um, refuse disposal, uh, uh, um, like in Aztec times, where people would collect material from latrines, and that would be used as fertilizer on fields. But we can only sort of speculate there. But there are some different suggestions for areas like where an oya is buried into a part of a building, or um, we also have these structures um, that they were mapped in the mapping project as insubstantial structures. They're basically concentrations of daub around the city. And they could have been really low status housing. They could have been storage facilities like granaries. They could have been temporary housing for migrants who came to the city. But I mean, there's no reason some of them couldn't have been outhouses of some sort also, um, but there really hasn't been much, much work on them. Ian Robertson did a little uh, work, but there, there are many more that could be documented. All right. And Joey wants to know, do the construction methods of the apartment compounds vary from the different cultural barrios, or do they all follow a single sort of Teotihuacan style? There is some variance. So one thing we note in, in um, Tlahinga so in the center of the city, it probably became so dense early that people were um, restricted with what they could do. They basically had you know, a square or a rectangular ground plan that uh, you know, just stayed because then there are you know, little side streets or avenues um, next to the buildings. Um, and uh, uh, had and and you know the, all the, the apartments were were um, clustered together and there was no place to expand. Whereas in Tlahinga, since we're out on the periphery, we can see that people had um, space to expand. And so actually, one of the you know we the Millen map is fantastic and is many is accurate in many ways. But one way that it's not accurate is in Tlahinga, they mapped all of the apartments as perfect squares or rectangles, just based on what they knew from the center of the city. But when we do um, remote sensing on them, or even the excavations that they did in Tlahinga 33, they show that they're not um, a totally uniform shape. They have they would, they would be able to add on rooms. And so over time, that gives an irregular shape to them. Um, as you know, their family's needs change, they, they, they could add extra rooms to them. We also see some differences like the, um, I mentioned the, the, uh, the stone lined patio floors. We have those in Tlahinga and they also have them in the so-called Oaxaca Barrio. Um, although strangely in the Oaxaca Barrio, there are also people from Michoacan living there and we have people from Michoacan and Tlahinga. Uh, and so that might be a different pattern because that's not typical in other parts of the city where you have these um, mosaic stone uh, patios. So there, there's a little variance like that uh, that you can see. And then otherwise, it's largely in terms of the quality of construction materials. So, uh, you know, the amount of nicely cut stone blocks um, in Tlahingo, like the, uh, you know, the, the steps around patios will be really nicely hewn blocks but others will be uh, just, you know, faced on one side or made of adobe, um, whereas in the center of the city, you can have much more extensive quarry blocks for construction. Hmm. And uh, Marilyn has a question. <clears throat> Was Shell acquired through trade or might have the Teotihuacanas gone to the coast for Shell? That's a great question. Um, and I don't know if there's a resolution to it. We do, I will mention there's our, our mural depictions in the Tatitla compound of shell divers. So people who are diving in water with nets and bringing up shell. So one might think that, okay, that, that must mean they were doing some of that if they're gonna go you know, back up to Teotihuacan and paint it. 
uh, or maybe they just were in contact with people from the Gulf or Pacific coast and uh, saw that sort of shell diving and, and were interested in it and, and decided to paint it. Um, but there is shell from both coasts. We have Pacific species and Gulf species. Uh, and um, interestingly, you know, shell, even though it was a non-local resource, um, Widmer, who I mentioned worked at, at Tlinga 33 earlier, he worked at this way out rural site um, uh, called Makishko, and there there was a lot of shell production. So shell doesn't seem, again, like something that was sort of controlled by the state in some way, that there seems to be, uh, have been a lot of sort of free enterprise of, or or freer commerce in Pedro Khan, where these people out on this rural site could be making shell pendants out of uh, imported material. All right. <clears throat> and Michael Smith says interesting remarks about the possible temple or priest housing. This is something he worked on in his senior honors thesis based on the TMP surface collections. Oh, yeah. I did. I mean, so, Mike, I did see in your the ancient Mezzo article, you talk a little bit about um, temple or priestly housing. Um, and so. Yeah, I think that's something we need to figure out a little more because, it, I mean, there are a, a number of them and um, I probably think they serve different functions. Um, but in this case, you know, we did see, well, later they look like temple structures, but earlier we maybe have this residential pattern. So maybe there's a shift from a more residential area to one that then has these more temple functions once it becomes a two meter high elevated platform. But certainly it's like marking a different type of living space than living right on the ground surface. Hmm. And talking about surface collections, when I was there at Tewatuwakan one time, especially along the, the nicely paved route uh, from one of the areas to get to one of the museums and the beautiful plants and different walls and places you could see. but anyway <clears throat> i could see beautiful little things <laughs> so i went over the little wall and and i was i was picking up little pieces of murals and um little pieces of stuff that you wouldn't think would be there <clears throat> and i was wondering is that because small pieces of murals they just don't pay attention to, so they're throwing them out there for the tourists to look at. Because there was a guard who appeared above me, and he had a rifle and everything, and uh, he just looked at me and smiled at me, and so I I kept doing what I was doing. So it, it looks like something that they put out for people to find. Is that true? I, I wouldn't think so, but I mean, you do tend to get like, so, um, you know, the rains are very seasonal there, they come very hard, and so then you could have periods where uh, things just get eroded out and they get exposed from water moving over them. Um, there are other areas that were dumps, so when the, the whole um, Street of the Dead area was reconstructed in the 60s and this big uh, Proyecto Teotihuacan, there are areas where just stuff would be dumped um, that was found in the excavations as they were consolidating things. So um, some of them are marked on the, the Millen map, actually. But there is, you know, you have to think this was a city of some 100,000 people living there for 600 years or so. Um, so the quantity of garbage is exceptional. <laughs> like, I think I've, you know, stated, and I, I, I think it's probably right, that Teotihuacan might be the densest concentration of obsidian that's not a quarry in the world, right? So any sort of quarry context, of course, has more. But um, just to have people who are not using metal, who are using this very breakable glass, and they have to keep reusing it and making new tools um, for that scale of city for that for many centuries, uh, um, would have, you know, probably led to to that because, uh, you know, in Eurasia, the uh, the first cities with tens of thousands of people in them were not using stone; they had had switched to metal, and so. Right. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if if that's the case. Of course, yeah, there's a lot of sherds, but there are in in most cities as well. 
Yeah, I uh, I was finding pieces of obsidian also, but this looked like it was deliberately taken and dumped around the bottom of trees and the, and the cactus and stuff like that. It it wasn't you know recently exposed. No, it wasn't uh, eroded. Yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe the vendors at the site sometimes pick something up and they're just putting them I, to the tree as they're sitting there. The same thing I found at Kalak Mool one time. It's like they would be digging, 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 and and sift through it and find stuff that they could provenance or whatever. And if it wasn't, they would take it and dump it down by the trees in front of the giant structure or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I even found a jade bead there one time. <laughs> Just walking up the steps, there's a jade bead. So, uh, so Peter's made a comment it's it's like uh he must make this comment while you were talking at at 9 19 p.m he says and it is a sector that has been overlooked in most recent narratives on the social structure of teotihuacan so i'm not sure what he means it is a sector that uh, has been overlooked hmm I'm not sure is that peter jimenez <laughs> yeah, Peter on mute. You mean Slahinga? <laughs> Peter, you want to unmute? He's still with us. Yeah, what I found really spectacular is the, the it was very explicit the evidence for that, the religious, you know, the temple insertion there in that unit that we excavated. And it's even more explicit than what Linda found in, in Philpan Casco, where she has a very, you know, a, a very a spacious area, but she considers an administration sector like a religious. Well, here it's really patent, very explicit religious structures, and that's that's something that's very new is in, to ask to, to analyze in here because the, the the narratives that we see, I think, after the in, from the eighties on, we we talk about the military aspects of the site and, and, and things like that. We lose the religious aspect of it that came very strong with the Armias generation. Uh, even at the Borges time, they talked about temple, uh, peregrin peregrination, temp uh, market complex for Teotihuacan. So it's important, I think, to get this aspect, this religious aspect, back into the scenario of what was going on above these intermediate elites that Wendell always talks about. You know, are these guys like representatives, representatives of the state, state, state structure that we've kind of like like a decentralized, like say a parish priest sector that's way out there, you know, and, and I'm trying to see how this goes in there because you're in your book, when you touched on the late formative religious aspect of, of Tlaxcala, it's really fascinating, that aspect. And then when you get into Teotihuacan, I don't see a continuation of that. Maybe now you'll, this will take your interest back into that aspect of that <laughs> religious structure. Someone has to do it because it's been absent from the narratives in the last 20 years. And uh -huh. that's kind of, there's a lot of oversight on that. And I think that's very important. That structure you found with those elements, it's like a slap in the face of us to say, we have to go back and rethink about this stuff again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter. I mean, one thing yeah. I'd also point out is that um, this area, so if you think of Tlahinga as for some people, the entrance into, into Teotihuacan, if, if it were, which I think it probably did serve as a pilgrimage point at times, we probably have a, a Maya king, Yash Kukumo from Copan, who might have done a pilgrimage there. It seems very reasonable that people were taking pilgrimages there for major rituals. Um, if you're coming from the south, you, you might have entered through here, right? And, and so that's where the you know southern entrance point is. And so some of these buildings right next to that could have in some way been you know one of the 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 um, entering gates or welcome points for uh, for pilgrims coming up. Uh, the street of the dead and I mean if, if you're thinking of people like do it you know arriving for religion then sort of processing in a straight way of the street of the dead makes sense and in that case they would be passing these buildings and it might explain why they're much more elaborate than one would have expected Peter do you want to mention the red circles or the yeah I tried right off that the, the use of the circles on the architecture like that and, and the almenas are identical to what Kelly found in Alta Vista and in excavations there in the 70s. And then 
in the late 90s, they came across a huge segment again of these nice almenas, just like you have there with the reputations of a circle like that and big red circles on pillars and pilasters and all painted on, on walls. And that's very interesting because the construction of Alta Vista is at 450, 450, 480. Mm -hmm. And so I, I will be interested to see the dates of your, what you get for this there, because, you know, that's always been a huge debate of what's going on way up here in the topic of cancer and, and the relationship of fossil peregrination way up north there. And that's interesting. Right. And so, with the pec circles too, right? Exactly. That's exactly. part of that yeah. Yeah. narrative. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, the, that the so-called year sign Almina, I have excavated some of them next to the moon pyramid, um, big ones, but here, this, this was a miniature one, which uh, I wasn't really expecting. I, in, in plus of the columns, we also found a, a mini monument with what seems to be a, a, um, a day or a year holder sign on it that might be like three tech pot, three flint. I saw Rob put a question in there about the calendar, but yeah, so the Teotihuacan has certainly used the calendar round. And in fact, they might've promoted it very heavily within Mesoamerica. And so some people, um, uh, well, uh, Bill Fash and others um, uh, believe that there was new fire ceremonies done on the sun pyramid, uh, like Aztec style new, new fire ceremonies of the binding of the years uh, every 52 years, but there might have also been for coronation events or um, certain dynasts taking office. Uh, and so um, you, you definitely see that iconography related to new fire type iconography and certain day signs. There are dates in the in the writing system as well. So I've got two questions that might be about the same thing you were showing because they both came in at 936. But Christopher Paul is asking, could the beads be ilmenite? They remind me of early formative uh, multi-perforate ilmenite cubes, though without so many holes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's a, a formative iron ore. Um, yeah, they could be. We, we did do PXRF on them, but I haven't. I mean, my student is doing a bunch of PXRF on different stone resources um and so and I, I i don't know exactly i'll have to check back with them if it could be that but it, or is that also ferromagnetic i'm not sure um but um in any case yeah it sergio calls the ones in the ciudadela tunnel high right um but I, you know i would also think they could be magnetite or ilmenite um something from the formative too and octavio is about asking the circular shapes you showed, were they local coins or wodelas uh, that Manzanilla cites for Teopancatzco? Um, these were shells. So those are actually spondylus shell beads. Oh. Um, and so we have a bunch of those. We do have uh, the so-called tecos or rayuela uh, made of ceramic. In fact, in compound 18, we found a deposit of you know, many dozens of them. Um, I'm a little skeptical that they are tokens that have to do with tortilla rations or something of the sort. They just seem so easy to counterfeit. All you have to do is chip a shirt into a circle. Um, but who knows? I mean, I, I've heard people in the Indus Valley civilization talk about to tokens for exchange in that way. Um, but I I have a hard time thinking of them as pseudo currency because they're just so common. There's shirts everywhere and under feet. So, uh, but and and we also have found them in like abundance uh, in compound eighteen that has no sort of administrative functions. It's just a a Tlahinga apartment compound. And uh, Christopher is asking just a note on masks without perforated eyes. Some masks in southern Mexico and. Guatemalan dances are worn above the dancer's face with a see-through cloth below. So these might not be just death masks, though they could be. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I they could have been on a headdress, right? We see some headdresses that have a sort of face in them. It's quite heavy, this thing. Uh, you know, it's you know, it's life-size stone. Um and it does have holes on the back for lashing that looks like it could lash nicely onto almost like a post. Uh, so, you know, it has a uh, indentation that's like rectangular. 
um, and then areas where it could have been tied uh, with where the perforations are. But and, yeah, I, I'm open to that idea too. I um, I don't think they were on mortuary bundles though. That's what I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm pushing a little against that idea that they were on mortuary bundles because I think they would just have, have crushed the skull and none have been found that way. And I know that, you know, they in the post-classic, there are examples of mortuary bundles with masks on them for sure, but um, I'm not convinced that was the case in Teo. And Chris is saying he's having some problem with the trouble with the audio. Ilmenite isn't as strongly magnetic as magnetite, but it is an iron ore, and he thinks it has some magnetic response. Oh, okay. That's interesting. No, yeah, because we didn't, we also didn't have a strong, it didn't move much. This was with Alejandro Pastrana. We dangled it off a little um, mm -hmm. shelf and introduced the magnet, and it didn't move a little, but not that much. So it looks like our last question here is about the calendars. Is there any indication that Teotihuacanos made use of the Mesoamerican calendar system or any other calendar? Was there a system of math? Oh, yeah. They certainly were into, to, well, geometry. They were into cycles. Um, they used the calendar round. Strangely, they seem to have been familiar with the long count. The Maya were at Teotihuacan drawing long count dates on walls, but the Teotihuacanos didn't think much of it and they didn't use it. Um, and so that's sort of fascinating where they just, uh, you know, opt out. Like they, they had this model for another calendar system and it wasn't of interest to them. Um, but they did really use the calendar round and, and potentially had new fire uh, ceremonies. That, that seems reasonable too. And yeah, we, we do have Teo style glyphs with numerical clauses. I excavated a small little effigy temple about this big, and it has a cartouche with a what looks to be a precursor of a, a tekpat or flint symbol with the number three below it. And that seems to, you know, because that of course was a, a year bearer sign in the Aztec calendar and, and probably had a common function. In fact, people like Nielsen and Helmke have um, documented a few likely year bearer signs um, that would have been analogous to the Aztec calendar, just earlier examples of Teo. Hmm. Uh, has anybody else got any questions? Uh, Joey says, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. The 3D modeling of your excavation work is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun toy. Now they're in your iPhone, too. You could have LiDAR on your iPhone. Huh. I don't think it's on my iPhone 13. I don't have a 15 yet. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, if there's no other questions, we'll end it here. Thank you so much, David. That was really, really great. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of mileage. Out of the, uh, we'll get a lot of mileage out of the uh, recording. And uh, Christopher, I'll keep in touch with you. And Michael, I'll keep in touch with you. <laughs> and I just says, thanks, David, and thanks to the organizers. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs> thank, thank you, David. <laughs> take care. All right. Everybody take care. Thanks for attending. Thanks for viewing this Outlander presentation, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To receive free monthly issues of the Outlander Magazine of the Americas, contact your host, Jim Reed, at myaman at bellsouth.net. Take care. <laughs>